Hello and welcome to The Trial of O.J. Simpson, Part 1. Background. The Brown-Simpson Marriage. Nicole Brown and O.J. Simpson were married on February 2nd, 1985, five years after his retirement from professional football. The couple had two children, Sidney Brooks Simpson, born October 17th, 1985, and Justin Ryan Simpson, born August 6th, 1988. The marriage lasted seven years, during which Simpson was investigated by police for domestic violence multiple times and pleaded no contest to spousal abuse in 1989. Brown filed for divorce on February 25th, 1992, citing irreconcilable differences. This is one of those times where if you don't know what it means to plead no contest, you should look it up. And if you don't know what irreconcilable differences means, you should look that up too. The murders. At 12.10 a.m. on June 13, 1994, Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman were found murdered outside of Nicole's Bundy Drive condominium in the Brentwood area of Los Angeles. Brown had been stabbed multiple times in the head and neck and had defensive wounds on her hands. Through the gaping wound in her neck, the larynx could be seen and vertebra C3 was incised. Both victims had been dead for several hours prior to, prior to their discovery. Among other evidence, one of the first two officers on the scene, Robert Risky, discovered a single bloody glove. Detectives went to Simpson's Rockingham estate to inform him that his ex-wife had been murdered. In the back of his home, they discovered a white Ford Bronco with blood in and on it. Detective Mark Furman then climbed over an external wall and unlocked the gate to allow the other three detectives to enter the estate. The detectives argued that they entered without a search warrant because of exigent circumstances. Specifically, a fear that Simpson may also have been injured. Simpson was not present when detectives arrived in the early morning. He had taken a flight to Chicago late the previous night. Detectives pre briefly interviewed Cato Kalin, who was staying in Simpson's guest house. A walk around of the premises by Furman discovered a second bloody glove that was later determined to be the mate of the glove found at the murder scene. Through DNA testing, the blood on the glove was later determined to have come from both victims. This, together with other evidence collected at both scenes, was determined to be adequate evidence to issue an arrest warrant for Simpson. Arrest of Simpson. Lawyers convinced the LAPD to allow Simpson to turn himself in at 11 a.m. on June 17, 1994, even though the double murder charge meant no bail would be set and a possible death penalty verdict if convicted. Over a thousand reporters waited for Simpson at the police station, but he failed to appear. At 2 p.m., the Los Angeles Police Department issued an all-points bulletin. At 5 p.m., Robert Kardashian, a friend of Simpson and one of his defense lawyers, read a letter by Simpson to the media. In the letter, Simpson sent greetings to 24 friends and wrote, first, everyone understand I had nothing to do with Nicole's murder. Don't feel sorry for me, I've had a great life. To many, this sounded like a suicide note and the reporters joined the search for Simpson. According to Simpson's lawyer, Robert Shapiro, also president, present at Kardashian's press conference, Simpson's psychiatrists agreed with suicide note interpretation. Over the television, Shapiro appealed to Simpson to surrender. At around 6.20 p.m., a motorist in Orange County saw Simpson riding in a white Ford Bronco, driven by longtime friend Al Collins, and notified police. The police then tracked calls placed from Simpson on his cellular telephone. At 6.45 p.m., a police officer saw the Bronco going north on Interstate 405. When the officer approached the Bronco with sirens blaring, Cowlings yelled that Simpson was in the back seat of the vehicle and had a gun to his own head. The officer backed off but followed the vehicle at 35 miles per hour with up to 20 police cars participating in the chase. Eventually, over nine helicopters joined the chase. The high degree of media participation caused camera signals to appear on incorrect television channels. Radio station KNX also provided live coverage of the slow speed pursuit. USC sports announcer Pete Arbogast and station producer Oren Sampson contacted former USC coach John McKay to go on the air and encourage Simpson to end the pursuit. McKay agreed and asked Simpson to pull over and turn himself in instead of committing suicide. 
LAPD Detective Tom Lang, who had previously interviewed Simpson about the murders on June 13th, realized that he had Simpson's cellular phone number and called him repeatedly. A colleague hooked a tape recorder up to Lang's phone and captured a conversation between Lang and Simpson in which Lang repeatedly pleaded with Simpson to throw the gun out the window for the sake of his mother and his children. Simpson apologized for not turning himself in earlier in the day and responded that he was the only one who deserved to get hurt and was just going to go with Nicole. Al Cowlings can be overheard on the recording after the Bronco had arrived at Simpson's home surrounded by police, pleading with Simpson to surrender and end the chase peacefully. During the pursuit and without having a chance to hear the taped phone conversation, Simpson's friend Al Michaels interpreted his actions as an admission of guilt. All big three television networks and CNN, as well as local news outlets, interrupted regular programming with 95 million viewers nationwide. While NBC continued coverage of Game 5 of the NBA Finals between the New York Knicks and the Houston Rockets at Madison Square Garden, the game appeared in a small box in the corner, while Tom Brokaw as Anchorman covered the chase. The chase was covered live by ABC News anchors Peter Jennings and Barbara Walters on behalf of ABC's five news magazines, which achieved some of their highest ever ratings that week. Benefiting from the event occurring in the evening, Domino's Pizza stated that its pizza delivery sales during the televised chase were as large as on Super Bowl Sunday. Thousands of spectators and onlookers packed overpasses along the procession's journey, waiting for the white Bronco. In a festival-like atmosphere, many had signs urging Simpson to flee. They and the millions watching the chase on television felt part of a common emotional experience, one author wrote, as they wondered if O.J. Simpson would commit suicide, escape, be arrested, or engage in some kind of violent confrontation. Whatever might ensue, the shared adventure gave millions of viewers a vested interest, a sense of participation, a feeling of being on the inside of a national drama in the making. Simpson reportedly demanded that he be allowed to speak to his mother before he would surrender. The chase ended at 8 p.m. at his Brentwood home, 50 miles later, where his son Jason ran out of the house, gesturing wildly. After remaining in the Bronco for about 45 minutes, Simpson was allowed to go inside for about an hour. A police spokesman stated that he spoke to his mother and drank a glass of orange juice, resulting in laughter from the reporters. Get it? Because his name was O.J.? Shapiro arrived, and Simpson surrendered to authorities a few minutes later. In the Bronco, the police found $8,000 in cash, a change of clothing, a loaded 357 Magnum, a passport, family pictures, and a fake goatee and mustache. Neither the footage of the Bronco chase nor the items found in the Bronco were shown to the jury as evidence in the trial. The trial. On June 20th, Simpson was arraigned and pleaded not guilty to both murders. As expected, the presiding judge ordered that Simpson be held without bail. The following day, a grand jury was called to determine whether to indict him for the two murders. Two days later, on June 23rd, the grand jury was dismissed as a result of excessive media coverage, which could have influenced its neutrality. Jill Shively, a Brentwood resident who testified that she saw Simpson speeding away from the area of Nicole's house on the night of the murders, testified to the grand jury that the Bronco almost collided with a Nissan at the intersection of Bundy and San Vicente Boulevard. Another grand jury witness, Jose Camacho, was a knife salesman at Ross Cutlery, who claimed to have sold Simpson a 15-inch German-made knife similar to the murder weapon three weeks before the murders. Shively and Camacho were not presented by the prosecution at the criminal trial after they sold their stories to the tabloid press. Shively had talked to the television show Hard Copy for $5,000, and Camacho sold his story to the National Enquirer for $12,500. Rather than a grand jury hearing, a probable cause hearing was held to determine whether or not to bring Simpson to trial, which was a minor victory for Simpson's lawyers, who would now have access to evidence as it was being presented by the prosecution in contrast to a grand jury hearing. After a week-long court hearing, California Superior Court Judge Kathleen Kennedy Powell ruled on July 7th that there was sufficient evidence to bring Simpson to trial for the murders. At his second arraignment on July 22nd, when asked how he pleaded to the murders, Simpson, breaking a courtroom practice that says the accused may plead only using only the words guilty or not guilty, firmly stated, absolutely, 100% not guilty. 
District Attorney Gil Garcetti elected to file charges in downtown Los Angeles, as opposed to Santa Monica, where the crime occurred. The decision would prove to be highly controversial. It likely resulted in a jury pool with more Latinos, Blacks, Asian Americans, and blue collar workers than would have been found from Santa Monica. Leading the murder investigation was veteran LAPD Detective Tom Lang. In 1995, the criminal trial of O.J. Simpson was televised for 134 days. The prosecution elected not to ask for the death penalty, and instead it sought a life sentence. The TV exposure made celebrities of many of the figures in the trial, including the presiding judge, Lance Ito. Prosecutor Marsha Clark, a deputy district attorney, was designated as the lead prosecutor. Deputy District Attorney Christopher A. Darden became Clark's co-counsel. Since Simpson wanted a speedy trial, the defense and prosecuting attorneys worked around the clock for several months to prepare their cases. In October 1994, Judge Ito started interviewing 304 prospective jurors, each of whom had to fill out a 75-page questionnaire. On November 3rd, 12 jurors were seated with 12 alternates. Televised by Court TV and in part by other cable and network news outlets, the trial began on January 24, 1995. Los Angeles County Prosecutor Christopher Darden argued that Simpson killed his ex-wife in a jealous rage. The prosecution opened its case by playing a 911 call that Nicole Brown Simpson had made on January 1, 1989. She expressed fear that Simpson would physically harm her and he could be heard yelling at her in the background. The prosecution also presented dozens of expert witnesses on subjects ranging from DNA fingerprinting to blood and shoe print analysis to place Simpson at the scene of the crime. The prosecution spent the opening weeks of the trial presenting evidence that Simpson had a history of physically abusing Nicole. Simpson's lawyer, Alan Dershowitz, argued that only a tiny fraction of women who are abused by their mates are murdered. Within days after the start of the trial, lawyers and those viewing the trial from a single closed circuit TV camera in the courtroom saw an emerging pattern. Continual and countless interruptions with objections from both sides of the courtroom, as well as one sidebar conference after another with the judge, beyond earshot of the unseen jury located just below and out of the camera's frame. Jury. According to media reports, prosecutor Marcia Clark thought that women, regardless of race, would sympathize with the domestic violence aspect of the case and connect with her personally. On the other hand, the defense's research suggested that women generally were more likely to acquit than men, that jurors did not respond well to Clark's combative style of litigation. The defense also speculated that black women would not be as sympathetic as white women to the victim. Both sides accepted a disproportionate number of female jurors. From an original jury pool of 40% white, 28% black, 17% Hispanic, and 15% Asian, the final jury for the trial had 10 women and two men, of which there were nine black people, two white people, and one Hispanic person. And that is it for part one of the trial of O.J. Simpson.